by the way, before it goes flying at some point. Um, if you are just joining us or are new with us, um, we have been walking through the book of Acts. And we are about at Acts chapter six and a half. That's official, um, if you haven't heard of that. But uh, we stopped at verse seven. And what we did, the reason why we stopped at that, if you'll remember, is we paused because we were looking at likely what was the first deacons that we've seen in the early church. And we took that time to uh, call our deacons here and uh, those faithful 10 men and women to the church. And, uh, and then we talked about elders and every member ministry and, ju- and just took a little b- bit of a break uh, during the summer from the series of Acts. So we are hopping back into Acts and we're going to be in Acts 6, 8 through 15. Um, and in a very real way, I feel like the Lord has just just placed the, the, the break and this sermon right where he wanted it. Because um, it's, it's no coincidence that we are studying a passage of Stephen and the beginning of this persecution, this strong persecution of the early church on the same week that we are hearing about our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan that are, that are constantly being persecuted now and sought out. And uh, it just made me kind of ask this question of myself, and maybe you find yourself here. Like, like we experience these troubles and storms and just kind of the futility and frustrations of life, right? And then we have these seasons where we hear about these natural disasters like the earthquake in Haiti and all this stuff, and then, um, and then, like you and some of the people in our church, just walking through very, very hard times, and and we hear these men and women being uh, killed this week, and persecuted, and hunted, and these young ladies just ravaged and forced into slavery, or uh, these so-called marriages, and all this stuff over in Afghanistan. It just, it's just hard for us at times, right, just to to figure out what do we do with that. L- like, how do you and I live in response to this world? At times, right? Like, you ever find yourself just not even really knowing what to do? Like, what's next with that? Um, and I, what we have here is this this beautiful picture of exactly what God designs for us and desires for us to do as His people. Uh, and we're going to see this in the life of Stephen. And I'm just going to kind of give you the kind of thesis statement of the sermon first, and then we're going to build it out. But uh, is, 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 as I was studying this passage and going through this. It's just clear, uh, and it was just a beautiful testimony of God's design and his desire to continually equip us for our life and the mission. Uh, if we're not careful, uh, we can live our Christian lives where we've been gifted with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we just go on living life, right? And, but, but we'll see in the life of Stephen, if we're going to respond the way that the church needs to respond and live in the way the church needs to live and, and be on mission the way we need to live, then this design of God's good grace to continually, day in and day out, equip us for this life and for this mission is something that we desperately need. Uh, so uh, what they need in Afghanistan, what we need here, what our, what our family and friends need is this continual equipping. So let's pray, and then we'll read our passage together. <clears throat> God, you are so good. God, you are our hope in life and death. Um, it is in you, Jesus, and uh, we are gladly boasting of our weakness and of our need for you, God. And uh, we, you know, we just we already prayed for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Would you just just strengthen the Christian church in that area, God, as to 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 see your continual daily equipping, Father, your daily grace towards them, um, and your provision for them, your security for them, God? Would you allow us to see that in this text today, God? That that you have designed us. And your desire for us is to be in this constant fellowship with you. And would you just show us this in the life of Stephen? And would you just just allow us to uh, just see a better picture of you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Another reason, right before we hop into this text, that, that, that this life of Stephen is so interesting to me is not just because his name is awesome, but because um, that he is an ordinary church member. See, so far in the book of Acts, uh, we've seen Jesus do amazing and great things. And then we've seen the apostles, obviously by the power of the Holy Spirit, do these great and amazing things for God's glory, right? And we've seen God just using all of these circumstances. And we know the church is back there somewhere, like doing something, but we haven't been given like a real big, clear picture of that yet until Stephen. And sure, he was recently elected as likely one of the first deacons that we talked about a few verses before this, but this is an ordinary God-fearing, Christ-honoring church member Christian. And this is one of the men that God is going to use to launch his global discipleship redemption story forward 
through the life and persecution of Stephen. And we're going to see the way he affects people like Philip and Peter and Paul and all these people. And, and his life and persecution, the events of all of this, are referred back to like three times in the book of Acts. It's just this tipping point of God doing something amazing through one faithful Christian, this ordinary church member. So this, this is God's design for us. It's for all of us to live this way. So let's read with that in mind. It starts off in verse 8. <clears throat> and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Syri- Syri- Syrians, sorry, I can't ever say that, and the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So pause there for just a minute because there's a shift here if we're not paying attention for it. So, it, And initially, you have this one group of people that are, uh, these would have been the Jews of dispersion, right? This is, these would have been Jewish people that were enslaved for some reason but have now been set free, okay? And obviously, even though these were Hellenist Jews, they were not agreeing with what Stephen was teaching, what he was doing, the things that were coming out of his mouth. So this dispute arose, right? And they try to go with him, and we see that they could not withstand. So what happens? They take it up to the next level, okay? Then we'll start in verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. This would have been the Sanhedrin. Verse 13. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw his face was like the face of an angel. So this is the third of four times that we're going to see in the book of Acts. The apostles or the people of God brought before the Sanhedrin. Right? So this group has escalated this all the way back up to the same exact spot where the apostles were on trial and facing this court, and they've been beaten and flogged and all this kind of stuff. And what do they do? They set up these false witnesses. And this story, one of the reasons you see like the life of Stephen, in a real way, Jesus and the apostles like handing off and equipping and encouraging all these members of the church is the way that, Jesus, that, uh, that Stephen is very much facing the same things that Jesus has faced through his life and the persecution that he faced. Right? They're making up these false testimonies. They're bringing him for these false trials and all this kind of stuff. But what we see here is when it says false witnesses, likely a lot of the things that people use against Christians or they used against Jesus and the apostles, there was part truth in that. They weren't making up all this stuff, most likely, right? Stephen very well may have been talking about the destruction of the temple, just like Jesus did in the Gospels, right? And how it, it was broken down and it was built up within three days, right? And all this stuff. So what they're doing is that they're twisting his his meanings and, and what he's saying and what he's trying to get across, right? And, and next week, Ryan is going to get into what happens when Stephen starts speaking. So we're not going to worry about kind of that part right now. We're going to take some lessons from what's going on right now. And if you'll remember a second ago, we talked about how we ask ourselves that question sometimes of how are we supposed to live in light of this world? What are we, like daily, what does that look like for us, especially when we see all this craziness happening around us in our life? And Fortunately for Stephen, and fortunately for us, God has not left us to figure that out on our own. Stephen is very much operating his life and the mission in troublesome times exactly how God's good plan for him is. And we're going we're gonna to see that by all accounts, this is God's grace active and going in him. So the first thing I want to point out here is that there's going to be one overall theme, but we're going to talk about that in two truths. These two amazing truths that we'll see in the life of Stephen And then we're going to just connect that all together in this one beautiful theme for how God continues to equip us to do this. So the first thing we're going to look at is that God continually equips us as we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So even as I say that, we've heard that kind of stuff before, right? And we we think about verses like Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled with the Spirit. So we know that we're not talking about the initial dwelling of the Holy Spirit that comes upon us and we're salvation. That is a, a good gift from the Lord. And we'll see that this full of or filled with or be filled of is the same, uh, this beautiful grace, just in a different way. So uh, let's first, let's see how it was described in Stephen's life. How, how do we know that's coming from this text? So we started off in verse 8, but if you'll look back just a couple at verse 3, when they're talking about deacons, they say, well, it's got, they need men that are full of the Spirit and wisdom. Okay. 
And then when they call out Stephen specifically and say they had chosen him, they say that he was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Okay, in the verses that we started in, in verse 8, what did we say? He is full of grace and power. And we know that manifested itself in signs and wonders, also in verse 8. But in verse 10, we see again, they're disputing with him, but he's full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. And uh, at the end of chapter 7, when Stephen's in the middle of his persecution, you see this sentence once again that kind of sums him up. And he says, but he, full of the Holy Spirit. See, God is having Luke write this in a way that literally these things should be just jumping off the pages at us. Because Stephen is an example of, of this continual life. Like the emphasis on Stephen is this continual fullness in the Christian life. See, because herein lies the danger for you and I. Is that we can be a Christian with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, yet not be full of the Holy Spirit like, like Stephen is described here. So what does that mean? How does that look? That can get a little confusing, right? Well, one thing I want to do real quick is, is hop out of this text from somebody that was hugely impacted by the life of Stephen, uh, which is Paul in Ephesians 5, 15 through 18. And I think this passage just helps us, helps us really grab on to what this meaning of full in the Spirit really is. So let me read this to you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So there's the exhortations from Paul. He's saying, be careful how you're going to live. Be careful what you're going to do. If you're going to be who God's called you to be, you need to look. You need to be careful. Don't be foolish. Then here's the exhortation in 18 we're really going to focus on. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So first, look at the negative part, right? He says, do not be filled with wine. And people have used this for all kinds of different stuff. But let's break this down a little bit to see what the meaning behind this sentence is. So he already told them at this part of Ephesians, they've been filled with the Spirit, right? This is how we know this is something completely different. And he's calling them to be filled, okay? So what's going on? Paul is trying to get them to carefully walk. And then what does he say? He talks about this wine and this fullness. Well, think about that for a second. If they willingly become filled with wine, to the point where they experience this drunkenness, right? Think about this for a second. They have released total control of themselves over to this wine and drunkenness, right? They are no longer operating as they once were. They have completely given over control. And this alcohol, in this sense, this wine, has become this agent, and it is now this controlling, influencing factor in their life. They have lost all normal uh, function and they have given over to this drunkenness and this wine. So what happens is, think about this for a second. When when you when you experience when you've seen this experience, this drunkenness, what begins to happen? Well, that changes the way people think, right? In an instant, it changes thoughts, it changes speech, doesn't it? It changes actions. There's a lot of things people have done when controlled and filled by wine they wouldn't have done sober, right? Their desires or motivations begin to change. They find things important that maybe shouldn't be that important. And many other areas of life is just completely given over to this agent that is the wine. So Paul is warning people that there is a way that you can be filled with something that will have devastating impacts on your walk in the faith. And then what does he do? He flips that around now that they can kind of connect that. There's an illustrative purpose there, and he begins to talk about the Holy Spirit. And he uses that thought for the Christians, right? And he says, don't pour wine in so it controls your body, but instead, like, willingly surrender your lives so that you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit under the all control of God. Let the Holy Spirit be what fills you up and is the driving force and influencing factor behind everything that you do. So he's saying, rather than pouring wine in and being controlled by that, where that in, under the influence of alcohol, we hear that word a lot, right? Like He wants these Christians to be under the controlling influence of the power of the Holy Spirit. Like so well and active in them that it's not just this filled up. Like you and I picture this container and we're filling it up with a jug of water. In the Bible, when it's talking about this filling, it's talking about the controlling influence of what's taking place. And he wants that to be the Holy Spirit. So what would that look like for us? What would it look like for Stephen? 
right? It's this daily waking up, denying ourselves, emptying ourselves, our self-centered tendencies, our sin, all the things that we want to accomplish, and it's totally surrendering that and getting on our knees and surrendering to the Holy Spirit through prayer and study and meditation and saying, God, I know I got to go to work today, but what I do there, how I get there, the relationships I build, what I say, God, that is yours. What do you want me to do today? Now, for those of us in relationships, like I think I'm going to do this, but God, what do you have for me? What does this look like here? Before we go to school, before we go to work, before we decide where we're going to move or how we're going to be, we lay all of this at the foot of our Father, and we say, God, you guide me through the power of your Holy Spirit, right? And he is wanting them to live this way. And we see this in the life of Stephen. Look at his example, right? You can tell that, that it is not Stephen's self-centered focus driving him in Acts 6, especially in Acts 7. You can tell that there is something controlling who he is, that he is giving himself fully over and surrendered his life for that purpose. You can tell he's controlled by the Holy Spirit's desires and the way that he's speaking and moving. It says that he's got this, he's full of this faith. You see, if, if an ordinary person was standing before the same council that has crucified Jesus and flogged all these apostles, it makes much more sense to tuck tail and run, does it not? Yet Stephen standing there, full of faith and trust in the sovereignty of his God. And he's saying, if this is where God has me, I'm in. Right? Think about, what, think about the wisdom that's controlling him, that's, that's pushing him, that's his influencing factor, this wisdom of God. It says they couldn't even dispute with him, right? And many people think Paul was one of the people that likely might have been in there, right? And even if he wasn't, like all these, all these, all these wisdom of earth men, right? These 71 men of the Sanhedrin, and, and none of these people can say anything to him, right? We'll get into it next week, but the grace that is, is the influencing factor behind what Stephen does and what he prays near the end of his persecution for these people, it is no doubt that it is the grace of his Savior that is motivating him to speak and act in those moments. It's nothing man-made or human that can, that can extend this kind of grace. But herein lies the problem for us as Christians, does it not? Like, we're prideful, self-centered people. It's hard to give up control of our lives, isn't it? I mean, inside of us, every day, we want to wake up and we want to do what we want to do that day, don't we? Like, it, this doesn't come natural for us. This is why in places like Romans 6, Paul's saying uh, that you're dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus to God. And then 12, the verse right after it, he says, let sin therefore not reign in your mortal body, because it's going to make you obey its passions. So if you let the sin, the self-centeredness and pride reign in your body, it's going to make you obey its passions. What's another way to say that? It's your controlling influence. If we don't lay down the self-centeredness of our own little kingdom, that's what's going to be our controlling influence for the day, for the season of life that we're in. What would Stephen have been if that's what was controlling him that day, right? What does that look like then? So you and I, we would do well here to stop and ask ourselves, like, which way are we living the Christian life? Like, do we wake up every day? And before we leave, before we begin our day, do we, do we release and deny all of our selfish, self-centered plans and dreams and hopes? Because we realize that gods are so much better and so more worthy and just like we did on the day of our salvation, we humbly submit to the will of the Father. And we say, God, whatever it is you have for me today, that's what I want to do. I'm not going to act without the power of the Holy Spirit guiding me and leading me. I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to think. I'm not going to do. Like, God, what do you want from my life? Or are we caught up in some Christian version of the American dream where we're fine to receive this salvation yet not live as if we're being influenced and controlled by the same Holy Spirit that saved us. Like, what do we want to be as a people of God? Because that's what the church in Afghanistan needs, does it not? 
They need the people set on fire to humble themselves before the Father and say, you control me, you guide me, you lead me. And it's the same thing that we need. See, in these texts, this thought is this continual filling, this continual controlling and influencing factor. Because if we do this on Monday, but not Wednesday, are we not a completely different person on Wednesday than we were on Monday? Like, can you see that God's good design is for us, every church member, every Christian, to be daily beholding his glory and just submitting ourselves to who he is? And this is a part of what we see. The second truth that comes here is kind of what ties everything together with this, with this theme, with this doctrine that we'll see. The second truth we see here is God's design and desire is to continually transform us into the image of Christ. So his desire and his design first is to continually equip us to live life, to live on mission. And how does he do that? We, we submit ourselves, we deny ourselves, and then we live by the power of his spirit. We hear him, we seek him, we pursue his good. And then what does he do as a result of that? He continually transforms us into the image of Christ. And this is the overall theme of what we see in Stephen and what we see of the church and what God is doing with us. We know this is the doctrine of what? Sanctification, right? We hear that word a lot, but practically, have we ever thought about it like this? Like this is where there's a lot of tension here between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Like, like there, we are exhorted all over. We know that salvation is God's work, and he extends the good gift of faith and grace and salvation. Yet, we have this poured all over us to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, to train our bodies, right? So we see these two things come together in this glorious doctrine of sanctification, this progressive act of God saving this day by day by day by day, when his people, when when his people submit before him. So I told you earlier, we'll see this played out, the second part played out in the life of Stephen also, but I said literarily and theologically, Stephen is doing some amazing things in, in just this small passage of scripture. So I'm going to read three real quick, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to Think about the person of Moses, what you know about Moses, who he is, the events of his life, and we're going to see his, him referenced or something about him in four verses in this, this short little passage, 8 through 15, that we're reading. So something's happening there. So let's, let's read that again. So look at verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Okay, so there's one. 13. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. Who does that remind you of? Right? Verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. So three for three right now. Right? So here's the picture. Stephen is standing in front of all the Sanhedrin. There's 71 men gazing at him intently. That word is like glaring at him, right? And all, the entire chapter 7 is Stephen's rebuttal and then the very end of his persecution. And before all of those words, this is the longest recorded message and, and, and like spoken word in all of the book of Acts is Stephen's rebuttal here in chapter 7. But before that starts, we're given this picture and Luke just throws in this little sentence like it's something we might not would even think much about. And now look at 15, as they're all standing there, gazing at him, looking intently. All who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. What does that remind you of with Moses? Right? Yeah. He's seeing the glory of the Lord on the mountain, right? He's receiving these Ten Commandments and all those times. And what happens when he comes down? And the first couple of people see him. What do they say to him? He said, his face shone. And what does he do? It's temporary, so he puts a veil there, right? But Stephen's face was shining in the same way, that he is so much in the presence of his God that God's glory is radiating off his face. So how does that connect to us today, though? One other passage I want to read you real quick is so somebody, again, I mentioned Paul. He's hugely influential uh, would have been highly influenced by the life of Stephen. He writes this about that same exact thing, the contradiction between Moses' veiled face in the old, under the Old Covenant and this veil that's taking place in the New Covenant. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. 
Since we have such a hope, hope in Christ, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would have put a veil over his face so the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. 14. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. (laughs) Sorry. Yes, to this day, Whenever Moses is read, a veil of lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Listen to verse 18. And we all, Christians, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So get the theological picture that is being used by Luke, talking about the life of Stephen. Under the Old Covenant, right, you had Moses' face that was temporarily shining from this glory of God. It was temporary. He knew it was fading, so he covers his face. And then when he would come into the presence of God again, it would lift, right? But why is it temporal? Because death had not been defeated. The wrath of God had not yet been justified. Sin and death still reigned in some ways. But all of God's people, at best, they're getting this temporary, this temporary glory and uh, manifestation of God's presence at best. Right? You see this in Moses. You see this in the temple with the Holy of Holies. Right? Only a couple Christians could enter in there. And that was only every once in a while. Right? The rest of the time, the, the best chance these people have is seeing a little bit of radiance off of that, or they're, they're sitting out in the Israelites. Think about the camp, right? And Moses is the tent of meeting outside the camp, and all these people are gathered at their tent, and they're just watching as this cloud of God's presence comes down over the temple where it said he would meet with Moses. Like what? Like face to face, right? And, and they're gathered all around, and all this is taking place. And they're thinking, oh, how awesome is this? This is amazing. This is wonderful. Every bit of it, temporary. Soon to fade. Now under the new covenant, what do we see? Due to our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, right? Sin and death are defeated, are forevermore. We are no longer slave in bondage. The wrath of God through sin has been fully justified, right? And upon belief in Jesus Christ, when God extends this gift of grace and faith, what happens? As opposed to this physical veil that would go up and down, the agent of salvation, the Holy Spirit himself, takes the spiritual veil that is covering the eyes of the lost, and he rips it like the curtain, temp- uh, curtain that was torn in the temple when Jesus was crucified. Right? And for the first time, us Christians, we get to see who God is fully. We get to experience his presence. He places his indwelling Holy Spirit in us. And what happens? Our, we begin to radiate and become this glory of the God that saved us, right? And connect that back to verse 18. That was never meant to be the final thing. The moment God uncovers our eyes and drops our scales in that moment of grace that he shows us our belief in him was never meant to be a once and done thing. Read verse 18 one more time. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. From this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So see this. It says we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. The idea is this glory of glory. So Christians, this is for all of us, not just apostles, not for anybody. But as we behold the glory of the Lord day in and day out, and we do our part to to, to put aside our selfish desires, our worldly pursuits, this Christian American dream, and we choose to just ask God to fill us with his spirit and to guide us and to lead us, and we do this step by step and day by day, and the whole time, what is God doing on his side? We're just laying down this stuff as just mud pies, right? And we're, we're taking in more glory of the Lord. And what is he doing? He's growing us more and more and more to look like the image of Jesus himself. And why does the world need us so much? Because watch this. The Savior that we're following like that becomes the God that we're radiating for everybody else to see. That's why there's a difference in the face of Stephen. 
because he's waking up day in and day out to lay it all down to follow his Jesus day after day after day after day. He doesn't take a day off because he knows what's at stake, but he goes and he goes and he goes. And the whole time he is taking steps towards his God, what's God doing? He's making him look more and more like his Savior. So Christians, the obvious kind of evaluation question for us is, does that describe our Christian life? Like, this is God's good design. This is how he equips you and I day in and day out for life and for this mission. And in the face of all we face right now and anything we may face in the future, this is his design. And this is this doctrine of sanctification that we see in our lives that he wants us to experience. So are we radiating the Savior that we say we're following? People see our lives. Would they say that we're full of the Holy Spirit? Would they see God's glory just radiating from our presence? If not, I can start today, right? Like, if you're given breath in your lungs, it means God's not numbered your days yet. Your days are numbered, but yours aren't up yet, right? So we have got time to make this change. If you're here and you don't know Jesus today, you can be given the most beautiful gift anybody could ever be given. And we would love nothing more but to pray with you and talk with you and watch the God of the universe tear this spiritual veil from before your eyes this morning. So you can see him for who he is. And you can follow this God. Let's pray. God, you are overwhelmingly beautiful. God, you are overwhelmingly beautiful sufficient and beyond anything that we could ever ask or think. And God, one of the best things about you is you don't just save us, but you don't make us figure out this life on our own. But God, you've designed us and you've designed our Christian life to be this continual transforming moment by moment, day by day experience with you. So that as we behold you for who you are, we become the image of what we're staring at. So God, remove our eyes off of anything other than you. God, don't let us be satisfied with with beholding the things of the world, but rather, let us behold you. Because in you is the fullness of joy, in your right hand are unending treasures. God, we believe that. I thank you that you haven't left this life up to our own. And if we're going to be the church that we want to be, the church that you call us to be, the church that you deserve us to be, Father, show us your face day in and day out. Those of us that struggle with this, maybe we wake up and we know, like, we struggle to lay down our selfish thoughts and pursuits and to ask what you want from us. To be filled with your spirit in that way, Father. May this next song just be a song of of just release of all of that old self, God, that we wouldn't, we just want to daily wake up and just say that you are all that we need. God, those of you, those of us in here that don't know you, God, would you just show them your glory in a way that rips that spiritual veil from their eyes, God, that covering, that stopping them from seeing you for who you are, Father. Just name we pray. Amen. Would you stay in worship with us? And as you do, I just want to encourage you Maybe you find yourself there this morning where, where you know, like you've just been living in this season of, 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 yes, loving God, yes, wanting to follow God. But to be honest with yourself, you find yourself just, just holding on to a lot of pursuits and not truly giving yourself over and asking to be led and filled and influenced and moved by the Holy Spirit. So maybe this song for you is a time just to, to sing or to raise your hands or to just open your hands to release some of that stuff. Whatever it is, worship with us, please.